All right. Uh, well, the first thing I love to say um, is from Proverbs, um, Proverbs chapter ten and verse sixteen. It says, Woe unto you, O land, if your leader is a child. And it says in verse 17, Bless are you, O land, when your king or your leader is the son of the noble. He said they eat in I mean they eat not for pleasure, but for strength. So I said to you, blessed are you, Mavuno, because your, your leader is a son of the noble. <laughs> so goes the leader, so goes the people. Yeah. And the father of this house is a noble man. He's uh, a man of strength, a man of wisdom man that is knowledgeable and I just want you to know that you are blessed <laughs> yeah. you, you, you're blessed blessed to have a man like this when I was speaking you know I was listening this morning you know what I was thinking you know what I was thinking I was just planning how to kidnap him <laughs> just just some ways yeah some ways to just kidnap him and take him with me to Nigeria <laughs> you know because it didn't really look to me like you guys know what has hit you because when you have a leader like this, when you have a leader like this, a leader who gives permission, then you're set for a glorious destiny. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you're, you're just set for a glorious destiny. Uh, Pastor Helen, Pastor Carol, I just wanted to know from my heart, from my family, from the Elevation Church, that we honor you, we love you, we appreciate God for your life, we thank God for how he's using you, we thank God for the apostolic grace over your life, uh, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding that he has given you, we honor you very deeply, and we celebrate the Mavuno family. Yeah. Celebrate the Mavuno family. We believe in what God is doing here, and we see the Mavuno family as an extension of our own family. So we're just your extended family. Yeah, we are your extended family. And we believe that what God is doing this season and at this time and this age, uh, raising new global church movement is to reshape uh, the mindset starting with us Africans and then helping us to make global impact that will not be erased yeah. until Jesus comes. Yeah. That's his plan. And it's a privilege for all of us to be a part of it. Give your neighbor a high five. Say you are privileged to be a part of this movement. Yeah, you're privileged to be a part of this movement. It's a privilege. It's a real privilege. It's a privilege. Glory to God. So it's a joy for me to be here in Nairobi. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing happens by accident. God has a plan before the foundation of the earth that I'm going to be here this day because I'm only in for 22 hours. 
Wow. Yeah, just 22 hours. Uh, that's my stay. But God has a plan, you know, that this is going to happen. And I just want to align with his plan and his purposes. Uh, I'm already so blessed already. Just being here, seeing what is going on, uh, listening uh, to, to Pastor M, you know, enjoying my Vuno worship, wow. you know. And, and meeting all of our network leaders and just fellowshipping. I mean, I wrote in my note, I said, God, I know you brought me here because you wanted me to see what you are doing. You know, one of the ways that God helps us is to give us exposures. When God told Abraham, go out, count the stars. Just exposing Abraham's mind to see certain things. See, when God wants to help you, he helps you to see better. Yeah. He exposes some things to you uh, to just see possibilities. Yeah, see possibilities. And what he's expecting you to do is to trust him for grace to execute and, you know, and, and expand and just do. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> and I've been blessed. Yeah, I've been blessed. When you are in the company of greatness, you can't be small. So I'm here in the company of greatness. I'm going with the spirit of greatness. And you will hear about me more. <laughs> Praise God. All right, I want to bring us a word. In the time that, are you ready? You're ready? Okay, if you're ready, tell your neighbor, you are permitted. You are permitted. Say, permission is granted. Say, God has granted you permission to be all you can be and to fulfill your destiny. Say, whatever is going on in this season will not limit the fulfillment of your destiny. Say, you have permission. You have permission. Say, you are fearless. You are permitted. In the name of Jesus. All right, let's get into the word of God. Permission granted. That's what I titled this. Permission granted. So it's time to envision, lead, and execute. Because you have the permission. You know, one of the, the most terrible um, incidents that can happen to anyone, especially people who fly quite often, is for you to be kept in holding pattern. I'm going to explain. If you fly regularly, you realize that sometimes you are about to land in a country like we landed here in Nairobi last night. But the pilot needs to get some kind of clearance from the control tower. And something happened to me last week, I think, uh, uh, last, no, last Tuesday, two Tuesdays ago. I was, um, I was flying from, from, I think I was flying from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. So I was about to land at Charlotte Airport, North Carolina. And um, the pilot announced that we made it on time, but that the control tower says that we can land but remain on the tarmac. I've experienced this like twice. The first time I experienced this was in Lagos. I was flying from Abuja, our capital city, to Lagos. My friend, a pastor in Lagos, Pastor Yemi Davis, was in the same flight with me. As we were about to land in Lagos, the pilot announced that we don't have clearance from the control tower. That it was raining, the cloud was heavy, 
and all that. So he was going to just be moving around Lagos until we get clearance. So he was going around Lagos. I saw all the different parts of Lagos I had not seen before that day. <laughs> Initially, it looked like a good thing because it looked like a good excursion. So I saw Lagos Island, Lagos Mainland, you know, the Lagos Lagoon, the Atlantic Ocean. You know, we're looking at everything. After a while, my friend said, God, man, don't you think this is going on for too long? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't occur to me that there's anything to be bothered about until my friend said so. Then the pilot announced that if by any chance we don't get clearance in another 30 minutes, we may be going out of where. <laughs> ah, going out of where? He said, and our best option may be to go to Benin Republic because it's closer than going back to Abuja so that we can land in Kutonu. And it meant that we're, we're traveling within Nigeria, yeah. and all of a sudden, there was a suggestion that we may find ourselves in another country. <laughs> <laughs> and that we may have to pass the night there. So, I was even thinking, how will I tell my wife that I'm now <laughs> in Kutonu, in Benin Republic? Ah, but you went to Abuja. <laughs> and then I'm going to pass the night here, and then come the next day. You know, all those kind of things. Graciously, eventually, we got the permission to land. I mean, sometimes people even get the permission to land, but you don't get the permission to come out of the aircraft. That happened to me last week in the U.S. Pastor M, I was pressed. <laughs> See, I, and I'm telling you the truth under God. I've never been pressed for pee like that before in my life. <laughs> Apparently, I was either studying or maybe watching a movie in this like two-hour flight from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. I forgot that I was feeling something in my bladder. Then we landed and they grounded us on the tarmac. What was supposed to be an interesting experience, looking through the window, and you see like 10 aircraft lined up about to fly, and they said until they, they took off, we can enter. And I was watching those aircraft, and I was praying, <laughs> God, let them go, let them go, let them go. I, I mean, ordinarily, I would have brought out my phone and be recording them as they're taking off. You know, when you see an array of aircraft just taking off, it wasn't funny at all. And they said, everybody, fasten your seatbelt. You can't stand. You can't do anything because we're still in motion, you know. After a while, I broke out in sweat. <laughs> the guy beside me was wondering what's going on. <laughs> this thing I'm telling you eventually took about 20 to 25 minutes when they eventually opened the door. Uzenbot could not have caught me. The way I ran. Uh, you, you get what I'm saying? Yes. Why am I telling this story? Is that sometimes in life, you are either denied permission or you feel a sense of denial. And when we feel that sense of denial or we are in a space where it looks like we're not permitted to give expression to the gift of God and the grace of God that we carry. We are repressed. We are under immense pressure. And sometimes we even misbehave. Sometimes we channel our gift in another direction. In a direction that may not bring glory to God or that may not lead us to where God wants us to be. One of the most beautiful things that can happen to you being a part of a family like this is that you are in a family that gives permission 
for you to land. Yeah. So you don't have to be under pain like I was. Yeah. Because you have permission to express yourself. You see, some of the vices and things we see in the lives of young people out there today is that they are in families, spaces, where they don't have the permission to express their God-given potentials the right way. So you see them going off target, just doing stuff anyhow, just wasting life and wasting destiny and misbehaving. They lack the permission to envision a better life, the permission to envision themselves in the scope of God's redemptive capacity to unleash them to fulfill their purpose in life. They lack the permission to take the lead, to execute, to think of brilliant ideas and bath them. You even get people who are in environments where they teach you to grow and grow and grow and mature. You're fed with the word of God so much. The only thing they don't say is that the proof of maturity is fruitfulness. When you see real adults, at some point they must give birth. <laughs> when you're not able to give birth, that's called barrenness. But you know you can be in an environment where you are fed, you are you're matured, but you're not given permission to be fruitful. So when you're in this kind of environment where churches are planted, campuses are launched, and all that, people are fruitful. You're enjoying unusual permission. Can you hear me tap your neighbor and tell your neighbor, it's not common. Because it's, there's a possibility for you to take it for granted to feel like it's a common thing. That, you know, everywhere you go, every family you belong, every church you belong to, you know, that things just happen like this. No, it, it's not common. It's not common. It's not common. That's why the Bible says in, you know, the scripture that I quoted earlier on, Proverbs 10 and verse 16, Woe unto you, O land, when your king or your leader is a child. A child cannot experience fruitfulness. So such leaders keep people as children also. <laughs> are, are you getting me? Yeah. And when you are around someone that has not been fruitful, your attempt at fruitfulness is a threat to their ego. Yeah. That's why the scripture says, Woe to you, O land, when your king or your leader is a child. Thinks ordinary thoughts. Plays around candy and cake. Yeah. And enjoys balloons. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, those are the things that excite children. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you listen to the message this morning. Does that sound like balloon to you? No. I mean, we're talking God's mind for the season and the hour and the understanding of the critical things happening in our world today so that you and I can participate in the divine intent of God and enjoy unusual redemptive capacity because the Bible says, upon Mount Zion shall be deliverers. Deliverers shall arise from Mount Zion. This is Zion. And the house of God. This is where deliverers arise from. And it takes a deliverer to raise a deliverer. Can I add this to it? That slaves cannot raise free people. It takes a free person to raise free people. When you have leaders with slavery mindset, 
they raise more slaves. And they keep people under. But when you have leaders, like Proverbs 10 and 17 says, Blessed are you. Fortunate are you. Empowered to prosper are you, O land, when your king is the son of the noble. When your king demonstrates strength. You know, and the Bible says the man of knowledge will increase strength. When there's strength, when there's knowledge, when there's understanding. Yeah. When, <laughs> when uh, your, your, your leader is, uh, is a, you know, is kind of person that can challenge you and say, they that do know their God shall be strong. That's strength. They that do know their God shall be strong. Shall be strong. So, what is giving you in this kind of atmosphere, for instance, I say, what, 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 what may be giving you a sense of lack of permission? Because I don't want to take it for granted that there may still be one or two people here who still feel uh, a sense of lack of permission. Permission to live excellently. Permission to be a visionary. Permission to lead. Permission to fulfill destiny. Permission to stand in spaces that God has here marked for you. What I'm sharing today relates to the stewarding of authority and how all of us as leaders can assume authority for impact. Because you have to believe that God has given you permission and you are in a family, a permission-granting family. Yeah. A permission-granting family. That's where you belong to. So you have to gain a sense of awareness of a divine empowerment to lead and to fulfill your destiny. I want to talk very quickly from the story, uh, maybe a couple of stories, especially from the Bible. Let me start with one story that my pastor told me many, many years ago. Close to 30 years ago, my pastor shared this story with me. It has never left me. You may have heard this story before. But it did something to my mind. And I hope it does something to your mind. There was this, this king who had an only daughter, very wealthy king, with an only daughter who wanted to get a husband for his daughter. But he didn't, you know, they were, I mean, just like we have here in Nairobi, a lot of handsome dudes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Some strong men. Can I, can I see some single men do like this? Hey. <laughs> Are you present today? Do it. Let, me, let me see your hand again. Uh-huh. Yeah. See some handsome dudes here, you know? Yeah. So imagine they got the news and a lot of them showed up. They showed up. This man had this Olympic sized swimming pool in his estate, the king, in the king's palace. When the guys showed up, all of them, you know, registered their intent. Some people just came, just wondering what was going on. What they didn't know was that the king had asked his people to get very big, large crocodiles. And he instructed those crocodiles to be starved for like seven days. They didn't feed them with anything. Yeah. So these fierce crocodiles, he said they should release them into a swimming pool. So the swimming pool was filled with crocodiles, hungry crocodiles. Then the king came out, and everybody shouted, long live the king, you know, and all that. The king said, no, yeah, uh, it's serious business today. You know, I have an only daughter, and um, whoever will marry my daughter is already my son, my son-in-law. Uh, obviously, coming into royalty, the family will no longer pay taxes. Uh, you know. (laughs) 
you know, and it would definitely have access to a lot of things. So I want a strong man. A strong man. So this is how it's going to go. If you think you're strong enough, then jump into the pool and swim through. Then I'll give you my daughter. Said, if by any chance you feel you don't want my daughter for your bravery, I'll cut you a check for $10 million. Just if by any chance you change your mind about my daughter. I'd love for you to marry my daughter, but if by any chance you change your mind, I'll cut you a check for $10 million. And then the young man looked at the pool and he saw crocodiles. <laughs> you know how those crocodiles do. So everybody was just looking. Hmm. Hmm. Who is brave enough? Who is who wants to die? <laughs> Whilst they were all still thinking and wondering what was going on, they just heard a splash. A splash meant somebody was in the water. And before they could look, 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 the guy came out on the other side. You need to have seen the ovation, everybody clapping and screaming and shouting. The king stood up, you know, wanting to see, who's that guy? The guy came out, panting, obviously, and the king's aides went, you know, almost carrying him, and then they brought him to the king. And the king said, wow, strong man. Brave man, you qualify to have my daughter. And by any chance, if you don't want her, the check is already here. I'm just going to sign. The guy said, long live the king. King, I'm sorry. I, I'm not interested in your daughter. I may consider the check. But the most important thing to me now, I want to know this stupid boy that pushed me into that pool. <laughs> this is where I'm going. Sometimes in life, you need a crazy person to give you permission. Yeah. And when God wants to help you, He sends you a crazy person that will give you permission. Pushes you into the water. Because you, you don't even know the extent of your potentials. Because somebody's listening to me right now. Somebody just pushed you into the water, planting a campus. But in you, there are a hundred campuses inside you. Yeah. And you are still wondering whether you are going to survive this one campus. Somebody is carrying a whole movement. They just push you into one campus. And you are wondering what's happening to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I've come to announce to you that you have the permission to take over territories. You have the permission to take over territories. You don't know what you carry. You can swim with the sharks. I don't know if you are guessing what I'm saying today. Literally, you can swim with crocodiles. Jesus said, behold, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions. And he said, nothing shall by any means hurt you. And if you believe the words of Jesus, then you must embrace leadership that gives permission. Leadership that gives permission that pushes people 
into the fullness of their destinies. Is somebody listening to me today who does not want to remain small? Position yourself beside a leader that will give you permission. If you want to remain small, then you can be messing around with people who don't understand your destiny. People who are pitying you. People... <laughs> You know, you can be messing around with people who just want to treat you like a puppy when you're a bulldog, a full-grown bulldog. You know, the treatment is different. <laughs> the treatment is different. Some of you have people around you now. They treat you like, like, a, like a pet at home. <laughs> when you're a military dog. I don't know if you, are, you, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. And many people exist in places where they're, they're, they're treated like a pet. Yeah, just, just rub your head. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, you are a fearless, fierce, destiny focused, called, anointed, and blessed person. And the globe is waiting for your expression. When you exist, Within a permission-given culture, that's the kind of culture that can give expression to the fullness of your potentials. From the story I told, that guy could have gone home that day without knowing that he had the potential to swim with crocodiles and, and walk home. Either walk into royalty or walk with $10 million. Either, either place is okay. Yeah. The potential is within. In 1 Samuel 17, you see the same thing. 1 Samuel 17, David woke up that morning without knowing that there was an encounter with destiny that day. I pray for somebody today, you will not miss your day of encounter. I say you will not miss your day of encounter. In the name of Jesus. There are days of encounter. Where you wake up. It's an ordinary day. The only thing. Is you get a call. From your network leader. <laughs> Just a call. Or a whatsapp message. You get a whatsapp message. From your network leader. Or your movement leader. And a demand is placed on you. To do something sometimes ordinary or mundane. But you don't know that this ordinary thing may be setting you up for destiny fulfillment. So David woke up that morning, 1 Samuel 17 and verse 4. David was the youngest of the three. The three oldest followed Saul. They were men of war. You know some people... There's nothing you're going to do. You may never look like it. Yeah. You don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I go to places in the world. Uh, let me make you laugh. Um, <laughs> this, 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 this happened last week. Uh, yeah, just a little over a week ago. I was traveling to the U.S. Uh, wait, wait, wait. My... <laughs> <laughs> one of our leaders, the guy who runs our foundation, a tall guy, you know, he was with me because we left from a conference to the airport. And then, um, Mensa, were you there? No, no, no. It was Kenny that was with me, right? Yeah. My media officer was also with me. And I was, and I was driven, <laughs> I was driven to the airport and when we got to the airport, there was a, a, a person that was supposed to help us manage the process. And just, when we got there and we came out of the car, the guy who went to, no, no not even the media officer, you know, uh, went to the other guy who was with me, one of our senior staff. He said, welcome, sir, welcome, sir. Um, so you're going to the U.S. I have, can I get your passport? And the guy was just looking at him. The guy was trying to signal him that. That's it. 
<laughs> That's the <a> boss. <laughs> I behave as if I didn't see anything happening. And I walked on. The guy apparently still did not get the clue. And we're walking. We got to the counter. Yeah, it was British Airways counter. The guy still went to meet the man for his passport, for him to check in. I took out my passport, I gave it to. So he said, oh, oh, so the two of you are traveling. So you are going with your boss. <laughs> By the time it was clear to the guy that I was the one traveling, <laughs> it felt stupid. But this is where I'm saying, going. The Bible says, man looks at outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So tell your neighbor you may not look like it. Make sure your heart looks like it. Yeah. So even when you don't look like it, make sure your heart is right. Make sure your heart looks like it. Yeah. Some of us, it is not given to us to be big. My sister. Yeah. Shit me. Yes. It is not given to us to be big or tall. Yes. But we carry the heart of a lion. When David showed up, he didn't look like it. That morning, the father had an assignment for David. It was an ordinary assignment. Ladies and gentlemen, be careful how you treat ordinary assignments. Be careful how you treat ordinary assignments. Somebody may be looking for a big permission, but your permission actually comes in in ordinary stuff. Yeah. Be careful how you treat ordinary assignments. Because the father told David, today, you're going to do Uber Eat. Yeah, you just go and do delivery. You know, so you go to the Valley of Ella, carry cheese, carry bread for your brothers. You see this special cheese for the supervisor so that he will not put them where they will kill them. All right? So just a little bribe for the supervisor. Organize everything and make sure that you deliver it well. And David said, yes, sir. Yeah. David in his heart may have felt so that you really think I'm not good enough to really go and fight too? Because only the three first boys that went. Yeah. And I'm just good enough for delivery. Yeah. For Uber Eats. Yeah. Because somebody may be listening right now. You wish you're a network leader or missional community leader or whatever. But be faithful with where you are. Take the permission that you have seriously. Because he that is faithful in little, more is added. Yeah. David took that assignment very seriously. But one thing happened. Because David was used, he's already used to a life of permission. When he got there, his brothers were bigger, but they felt unpermitted. Even Saul, with all his armor, something happened to his brain. Permission canceled. Permission canceled. When he looked at Goliath, by the way, you need to recognize that Goliath was a national problem. It was not a personal problem. Some people are still dealing with a personal problem. And they're not giving themselves the permission to solve the problem. But somebody saw a national problem. His name was called Goliath of God, the champion of the Philistines. It was not an ordinary problem. Yeah. So, what problems face your nation? What problems are facing your city? 
I've come to announce to you that you have the permission to solve those problems. That was the mindset that David carried. And you know, when they queried David and asked him, who gave you permission? Why do you think? David said, I gave myself permission. Since. He said, when I was keeping my father's sheep, the lion came. I didn't call daddy to say, daddy, lion is here. Can I No. <laughs> because that's the way some of us behave. Yeah. Something is happening, you call it pastor. Pastor. Something is pressing me in my dream. <laughs> when you are supposed to say, you press me in my dream, I will press your neck. <laughs> and also, Pastor Em was telling us the other time, it's time to prepare for battle. You can't be calling your missionary committee leader. You see, I saw masquerade in my dream. You show up to masquerade and say, I'm... I'm an heavenly masquerade. <laughs> yeah. And you speak against whatever you're seeing. You know where I came from? People see masquerade in their dreams. Because some of our own traditional and cultural stuff, we had a lot of masquerades. Yeah. And uh, some of them will say masquerade is chasing them with a broom or something. <laughs> but one guy gave a testimony one day. He said he saw a masquerade. And he was about to start running when he turned back and said, what is it? It will look for one stick. Oh, yeah. Let's, and then masquerade started running. And then he woke up. And since that day, he has not seen the masquerade again. <laughs> and he said, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Tell somebody, say, use your authority. Say, take up your permission. David said, I was keeping my father's sheep. The lion came. The bear came. And I went after them. I gave myself permission to deal with them. He said, I told the bear. Yeah. The young lion. I grabbed the young lion. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That will defy the army of God. The army of the God of Israel. I gave myself permission. Even the king looked at him. By the way, you know that king was not the son of the noble. Yeah. He's a, he's a young man. <laughs> he didn't have strength. Because the Bible says if you fail in the day of adversity, your strength is small. It's not about the adversity, it's about your strength. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing that made Saul the king, you know, fear and be on himself. David saw the same thing. A level of strength, emotional fortitude, spiritual agility was different. It's not about the size of Goliath, it's about the size of the heart of David. If you fail in the day of adversity, it's because your strength is small. It's not about the adversity. The things that make some people cry, make some people laugh. It's a matter of strength. Yeah. It's a matter of your heart. It's a matter of the size of your heart. So next time, weigh yourself against the things that disturb your heart. And, and tell yourself, I want to outgrow this thing. I want to outgrow it. I want to outgrow it. Yeah. While David was dealing and giving himself permission to deal with lion and bear, he outgrew Goliath. Yeah. He outgrew Goliath. So when Goliath showed up, he was like, who is this? Yeah. Who is this? Who is this? <laughs> yeah, who is this? A circumcised Philistine? What are we talking about here? We came in the name of the Lord our God. We have authority. We have the power of God. We have been given permission to trample over serpent and scorpion. And Bible says nothing shall by any means alter us. And on the strength of that, David moved. I need you to understand something. When you gain a sense of permission, please never forget this. People with a sense of permission, they don't look far for them, from themselves. We look up, 
We look within and we look around. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that will defy the armies of the God of Israel? He acknowledged the God of Israel. And then the next thing was, he looked within and looked around himself. There was a sling. What God already gave him. Then he looked around and saw smooth stones. And he said, I don't need more than five. Just in case I miss him once. I need another one. Yeah. And at most, five will finish him. Yeah. And five is the number of grace. <laughs> so just operating under grace. And then, you know, while Eliab and Saul and all of them were looking at Goliath and saying, it's too big, it's going to kill us. David looked at Goliath and said, it's too big, I can't miss him. You know, if they give you a stone and say, him at something small, it's a problem. But him at something big, what's the problem? Yeah, it's, it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> No, so it's just easy. So it's not about the size of the problem. It's about the size of the person. Yeah. Tap your neighbor and say, what's your size? <laughs> Somebody can say size 16. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about the size of your heart in the Holy Ghost. The size of your heart in the Spirit. The size of your heart in the use of your authority. The size of your heart in the things that you attempt. The size of your heart in what you believe you can do for God. The size of your heart in the measure of influence. How you are stewarding your influence. Stewarding your authority. That's how we demonstrate the size of our heart. And I love to say this to all the leaders that are here. I want to beg of you. Please lead us. Let's follow the spirit of this house. The spirit of this house is the spirit that gives permission. The Bible says we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of sonship or adoption by which we cry, Daddy, Abba Father. And it says the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So this is a family. There's a spirit of adoption or sonship in this place. There's a spirit of sonship. Yeah. That's what Pastor Emma has been, you know, talking to you about. The spirit of sonship. If you are a, a, a son or a daughter of this house, then that spirit comes with permission. The scripture I quoted, I think it's from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 or thereabout. It talks about the spirit of sonship. Yeah, we said we've not received again. The There's the spirit of of fear. Yeah, uh, but we have the spirit of sonship. Yeah, yeah. or the spirit of adoption. And it says we we cry, Daddy, Abba Father. Yeah, Daddy. We know our ultimate Daddy is God. All right, but God gives us earthly daddies. Yeah, yeah. And the Daddy in this house is here. And when you pick up the spirit of this house, it's a spirit of permission. That's why we're fearless. It's a spirit of bondage, gain to fear. Yeah, but the spirit of sonship. And when that spirit is operating in your heart, what you do is that you are able to gain a sense of freedom. Give yourself permission to envision, to, to execute, to see things not the way they are, but the way they can be. Now, I need you to understand something. We, we foster that spirit by continuing to give people permission. We just continue to give people permission. Yeah. Continue to give people permission. 
you cannot afford to be a kind of leader that caps people's potentials. There's something that's called the law of the lead in leadership. That a leader can become the lead. You know, like a bottle, like a Coca-Cola bottle. Yeah, yeah. So rather than giving people the right of passage, you're capping their potentials. That is not the spirit of this house. And you must check your leadership from time to time. Am I a permission given leader? Yeah. Am I like the guy who pushed people into the pool? <laughs> or I'm like Elia, the brother of David in 1 Samuel 17. Who asked him, David, what are you doing here? He said, you, You're a stupid boy. You like to prognose, to put your eyes into what they did not call you into. Yeah. He said you are insolent. Yeah. He said you are an insolent boy. You like to just be seeing what they didn't call you into. Yeah. You see, earlier, David's older brother said, I heard you speaking with a man. He burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know you are conceited or insolent. <laughs> you are here. How wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. The Savior has come. You said he just came to watch the battle. Because you felt he can't do anything. Yeah. And if you can't do anything, then give him permission. Yeah. Give him permission. You know, there are leaders who hold back power. And there are leaders who give power away. Jesus gave power away. Luke 10 and 19, he said, Behold, I give unto you authority. You know, it's one thing for one person to be able to cast out devils and to say, You too, you too, you too, cast out devils. So then you look like me. The danger is that I may lose my influence. Because ordinarily, people think that if I can do what you cannot do, then I'm more powerful than you. Then I gain the right to lead you and use my authority over you. That's the lowest level of leadership. Yeah. Yeah. That's the lowest level of leadership. It's called leadership by position. Where you just press it on people. Don't you know I'm your missionary community leader? Don't you know I'm your network leader? Anytime you see, <laughs> anytime you see somebody talk like that, Please know that that is not a real leader. Yeah, that's not a real leader. A real leader does not have to remind you. Yeah. You know what Margaret Thatcher said, one time Prime Minister of the United Kingdom? She said, being a lady is like being a leader. If you have to say you are, you are not. <laughs> yeah yeah I mean you know you know how ladies carry themselves when you see a lady you know you've met a lady or if you're saying don't you know I'm a lady don't you know I'm a lady I know <laughs> yeah <laughs> I hope you're getting what I'm saying Let's create the atmosphere that gives people permission to fulfill their destiny. Yeah. The atmosphere that gives permission. We live in a culture, for instance, in Africa, where there's something called the power distance index. You can study it after now. Yeah. I have a little more to say, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much. What the power distance index, which was... Uh, something created by a, social, a German social uh, psychologist by the name Professor Geert Ofsted. It measures the power distance in societies, which is, in some societies, the most powerful people are extremely powerful, and the rest of the people are extremely powerless. So, 
The power distance is very high. Some people are just very powerful and some people are very powerless. Most of African communities are like that. Yeah. The power distance index for the United States, for instance, is 40. Nigeria, where I came from, the power distance is 80. It's double what you get in the United States. So, people have to fight to get their voices heard. Nobody gets permission. You fight for it. So in a high power distance society, there's a lot of violence. People fight their way out of poverty. People fight their way out of everything. They will do anything to escape that level, including crime. In a low power distance society, there are many opportunities. You are given permission to walk your way out of poverty, walk your way out of everything that you don't like. Yeah, they don't shut doors on you. Now, this is the danger. How do we construct spiritual families like the Mavuno family in such a way that it will be a low power distant environment? It's our responsibility as leaders. It has to become a culture. Yeah. That we honor each other, we honor our leaders, yet we maintain a low power distance environment. And if you don't get what I said today, please understand this. If you are a permission-giving leader, then you have already created a low power distance environment. You know the danger is for you to think, if I give people permission, they will not honor me. They will not respect me. Ask Jesus. Yeah. You know, ordinarily, Jesus should have told his disciples, I mean, for instance, they ask him many questions. One of the questions they ask him, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Yeah. And he taught them. So when you pray, pray after this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Yeah. He didn't tell them, you want to pray? Yeah. You want to pray? Is somebody like you? You that you are still eating raw corn on Sabbath day. <laughs> I mean, you know, his disciples were walking through a grain field. Have you read that in your Bible before? Yeah. And by the time you just look back, they were eating raw corn, uncooked corn. <laughs> you know, if you, are that, if you are a leader like Jesus, you just tell yourself, where am I going to start from? <laughs> I mean, what kind of people am I leading? I mean, can't you just behave yourself? As a follower of a rabbi, they did a lot of embarrassing things. Yeah. And yet, they will still be seeking permission to do great things. And yet, he still gave them permission. I mean, just imagine someone, someone like Peter in uh, is it Matthew 14 or so, that Peter. I think in verse 25 or so, Jesus appeared to them walking on water in the middle of the night. And why everybody was still, hey, it's a ghost. Hey, what's happening? Peter just showed up, said, Master, if it's you, tell me to come. Give me permission. And, and Jesus said, come. And he started coming. And he was walking on water. Even when he started sinking, Jesus still went to help him. They walked onto the boat together. You know, if he was a different kind of leader, he can give the permission and withdraw it. So when he started to sing, I said, see your life. Yeah. See. You, too, you see? You, you, you are too... In my country, they say, you are pepper body, pepper body. As in, your, your body to pepper you. Eh? You just saw somebody walking on what? Have you fasted for 40 days before? You think ordinary people walk on water? Oh yeah, drink water, drink water. Drink water. You know, that's what some of us will do. Just say, I will allow you to drink water, but you won't drown. I will rescue you. No. Jesus did not allow him to drink water. The moment he started drowning, he went and put him up. They walked, on, he didn't carry him on his back. They walked on water together into the boat. That's a permission-giving leader. 
Are you still here? Let me add one more. Matthew 17 verse 1. Put it on the screen. Matthew 17 verse 1. Matthew 17 verse 1. You know, in Matthew 17 verse 1, this, this, is, this, this one we call uh, the, um, the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, let me put a picture to you. If God tells you, Pastor James, that I want to give you the greatest encounter of your life with me. This illustration I'm giving you is a difference between Moses and Jesus. Yeah. The Bible says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. This is the effect of grace and truth. God said, I want to give you the greatest encounter of your life. Who will you take along? You know some people, if God appears to them and say, I'm giving you an appointment, this is going to be your life transforming encounter. They will even forget that they are married. They won't take their wife alone. Yeah. Because all they will be thinking is, oh, this woman will slow me down. So, yeah, she will not be ready on time. Or some women will think, my husband may just say something that will annoy God. Let me go alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But on this day, the Bible says after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on the high mountain by themselves. Jesus knew what was going to happen that day. But he took his disciples along. What a disciple maker. What a shock. <laughs> he took his disciples along. Yeah. He granted them permission to participate in this encounter. Because as they were there, you saw what happened. There was a transfigured and there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His cloth became as white as the light. And then the next thing, all of a sudden, just then, appeared before them, Moses and Elijah, talking to Jesus. I mean, that was an unusual encounter. Yeah. The law and the prophet. This that's representative of the law and the prophets. Everything about the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament was the law and the prophet. All the books of Moses and the prophets showed up. And all of a sudden, without anything, something happened to Peter, James, and John. They knew Elijah. They knew Moses. Do you think Moses and Elijah introduced themselves? No. It was an encounter. It was spiritual spiritual and you see what Peter said verse 4 Peter said to Jesus Lord it is good for us to be here if you wish if you wish let us brand this moment if you wish let us turn this to a monument let us post for Instagram picture you know the things that Peter was thinking about if you were Jesus you would have slapped him to say is that what we're talking about here? Yeah, is this what you're getting out of this, this, this unusual thing? <laughs> Jesus gave people who somehow, sometimes seemed unprepared, yet he still gave them permission. Yeah. You know, some of us, some of us, God gave you a little revelation in your devotion and you refuse to share it. You are saying, oh, you see this revelation is too big for you, my sister. When you grow up a little more, I will share some deep things with you. <laughs> and you say, and I say I'm discipling you. 
and I cannot share some deep things with you. Jesus took them along. He made them experience it. They saw everything. Even the seeming, um, you know, <laughs> uncouth behavior of Peter did not bother him. Yeah. Because how do you explain that this was what your disciple will be thinking here? <laughs> but Jesus happened to be a permission giving leader. Anyhow, you must be a part of this. Anyhow, you must understand this. Anyhow, you must know this. You know the truth? When you're a permission given leader, you will know that everything adds up. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Today, now, for instance, I saw some young kids around, some seven, eight year old. I tell you the truth, everything is adding up. Some of the things we're saying here, now you may think that that 10 year old does not understand. Someday, it will add up. The child will, will remember something. The child may get only 2% of what I've said, but it's locked in somewhere. Yeah. When we're singing from Mavuno worship, I'm singing about our dedication to God, all in. You see, a child is dancing all in. And you think the child is just dancing, the child doesn't understand. One day, that child will be faced with candy that does not belong to them. And then the Holy Ghost will say, oh, inside. I'm not supposed to do this. I'm all in for Jesus. The child may not know any scripture, but may only remember all in. That was the premise of Christ for giving permission anyhow. Somebody say anyhow. anyhow. Yeah, just give permission anyhow. These same disciples, for you to know how it hurts up, by the time you are reading, I think it was First John, uh, is it First John one and verse one or so, or First John two and verse one, where the apostle John was writing, and he said the things that we have seen, that we have heard, that our hands have handled, of the word of life, these are the things that we are committing to you. Yeah, these are the things that we are committing to you. You know, it hurts up because by the time persecution arose. And they told them to deny. They said, We cannot deny what we have seen. Yes. If he didn't take them, would they see Elijah? Would they see Moses? It may look like they didn't understand it then. But when it came to the point where they needed to stand for what they believed, it's only stupid people that die for what they don't know. See, the reason the Christianity of this age. We must push the limit. People must have encounters. We must carry them with us in our own encounters. When persecution comes, they will stand. Because they will say, we cannot deny what we have seen, what we have encountered, what our hands have touched of the word of life. See that? First John 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, with look, and our hands are taught. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. <laughs> so, you can imagine somebody like John. They said, deny Jesus. He said, I cannot. I saw him on the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw the glory of God upon him. The glory came upon him. He turned, I saw Elijah. You read about Elijah. I saw him. <laughs> you read Moses, but I saw him. He said, You are crazy. He said, I'm not crazy. He said, But whichever way, do your work. What you want to do to me? Do. So they, they threw him into boiling oil. Because they felt he has lost his mind. But he said, We cannot deny. Yeah. We cannot deny what we have seen. That's what happens when. We give permission to people that were discipling to walk in our shoes, to engage our revelation. 
like Pastor M was sharing earlier, to engage our way of life, to pray at 4.30. Yeah? Praying at 4.30 is not the exclusive preserve of people like Pastor M. Yeah. All of us should pray at 4.30. Yes. <laughs> Are you still with me today? Yes. Yeah. Because there are encounters that you will have in those prayer times. There are revelations that God will give you. Yeah. That when your lion on your beard will come, you'll be able to grab them and solve your personal problems. And you know, it's when you solve personal problems that you're able to solve national problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because the way of the world is celebrity lifestyle. They classify people who have solved big problems. They call them celebrities. The way of the kingdom is that we start from small problems. And if that is faithful in little, more is added. More is added. More is added. So when you solve big problems, you cannot arrogate it to yourself. Yeah. yeah. That was why David could not take the glory to himself. The Jewish women came and they were singing. Saul has killed his 1,000. David killed his 10,000. But you know, <laughs> if, you're, if you are the kind of leader that doesn't understand the dealings of God, at that time, David would be like this. Yeah. 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 So, so, he said, let me post for Instagram. And Facebook with the award. Yeah. I kill Goliath. Then he will bring the sword of Goliath like this. Yeah. And holding Goliath's head. But the question that people don't ask when David killed the lion and the bear, who saw the picture? Everybody. So he doesn't need your picture when he killed Goliath. That was the only reason why Saul could not, not kill him. If he had posed with the head of Goliath, Saul would have taken him out. God protected him because he has a right heart. As you do exploits in this house, please know it's not about you, it's about God. All the glory to him. All the praise to him. All the glory to him. All the praise to him. Not of ourselves. Not of ourselves. Of ourselves we can do nothing. We can do all things through him. And he's given us grace to be faithful in little. More shall be added to us. And I pray over somebody in this house that God will make you a permission-giving leader. I said God will make you a permission-giving leader. I said God will make you a permission-giving leader. In the name of Jesus, that grace comes upon you to open the door for many people. Grace to raise more disciples. Grace to be that kind of leader that God can trust with revelation. The kind of leader that God can trust with kingdom mysteries. The kind of leader that God can trust with power. May the power of God come upon somebody here. Power to dream bigger. Power to walk upon serpent and scorpion. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Someone here, God will use it to solve problems in this nation. You will bring down the Goliaths terrorizing Kenya. You will solve problems globally. My God gives you permission to land globally. The global sea. In the name of Jesus. Lift your two hands to Jesus and just, just pray grace. Say, Father, let your grace come upon my life. Make me a permission given leader. Make me a permission giving leader. Make me a leader that gives power away. Help me to see potentials in people. Help me not to be the kind of leader that looks at only outward appearance, but the one that looks at the heart. Help me to believe in the potentials of other people. Help me to believe in the potentials of other people. Somebody pray today, say, God, use me. God, use me. Use me. Use me. Use me. Use me. Use me. Use me, Lord. 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 Lift your two hands to Jesus and just bless him. Just bless him.